All right, everybody. So today on the podcast, we have Peter Bond. How are you doing, man? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. How are you? Doing well, man. I appreciate you taking the time to come on today. What time is it over there? It's 3 o'clock, 3.20. Okay, not too bad. So, you know, I reached out to you. I'd seen you post in Lyle McDonald's group, Body Recomposition. And, I, you know, you post quite a bit there. And I'd seen him talk about you before. And not too long ago, you wrote this huge book on steroids. So how did that even culminate? Like, what made you decide to do that? Um, well, long story short, so in 2011, I think, I started writing uh, my first book, also about steroids. And it was simply uh, a subject I was very interested in at the time. And then after a few years of writing, uh, I finished that book. Uh, I think it was 2015. Uh, then I did a book on sports supplements. And then when I wrapped that one up in 2017, uh, it started itching again to write uh, a new book. And the obvious choice was to write another one on steroids, but uh, this time in English, as I've written my first two books in Dutch. Mm, gotcha. And so has uh, this been like, distributed well? Or where are you publishing it? I mean, because I heard about it, I guess... I guess I heard about it through Lyle, but I heard other people talk about it as well. So is it something that you've been working on distributing, or is it just kind of word of mouth? Uh, it's mostly word of mouth, I guess. Uh, I'm not really advertising or anything like that. And I'm uh, self-publishing, so you can only get it on my website as well. Okay. That's really interesting, because a lot of people, you know, when you hear about them writing books, it's often specifically to have it sold on Amazon or sold in bookstores. There's, you know, obviously this topic, it's a little different, but it's interesting. I mean, it really sounds like it's something that you did almost out of your own interest and for your own curiosity and then <laughs> published along the way. Yeah, to a, to a large extent, that's true. Um, like, obviously, I've considered selling it on Amazon, um, but shipping physical copies is uh, quite a thing. You yeah, know, for sure. Because yeah, and uh, with the ebook, so if I would sell it as an ebook on Amazon, they just charge uh, ridiculous prices on them. Uh, if it's more than ten dollars, you have to give seventy percent of the sales price uh, oh to gosh. Amazon. Really? So you got to have the price below ten dollars, uh, and at that point, it's really not uh, worth it for someone as small as me, so to say. Wow, jeez. So with that being the case, since it obviously wasn't written for money. Where did this yeah. interest for with steroids come from? So I started when I was, I think I was 19 or 20 years old. I started reading uh, about cell biology. Uh, I'm 20 now, 29 now, by the way. Mm -hmm. So about nine years ago. And from cell biology, I got in touch with biochemistry, uh, physiology uh, books. And uh, I was lifting weights, obviously. And so steroids uh, is a subject you get uh, confronted with quite early when you uh, sure. start weightlifting. And in a way, uh, steroids kind of combined all these uh, subjects I was reading about. Because uh, as you might know, there aren't really that many trials done with steroids in humans. Right. So uh, a lot of the information about steroids stems from research done in cells or in rodents and then doing some uh, molecular wanking stuff uh, with it. So uh, it kind of perfectly fit in with my interest uh, at the time and still is, by the way, still right. is my interest. So I see in Lyle's group pretty frequently, you know, they, they reference 600 milligrams and there's jokes about it. But, you know, obviously, you know, there's the few classic studies that use 600 milligrams of testosterone along with varying other doses. But how many people do you see in that group showing an interest in steroids? Because honestly, I feel like in the natural lifting community, it's like there is a huge proportion of natural lifters who want to use steroids and they just don't either because of the legal reasons or more ridiculous, in my opinion, is, is the people who would. If I mean, I have several friends who... I know if I were to get them steroids, 
they would use them. The only reason they don't, like, they're, like, one step away. They just don't want to, like, go through the process of finding somebody or ordering or whatever. But if somebody gave it to them, they would. And I feel like you can just see it in the tone of these people where they're they're almost kind of bitter about people who use steroids. So, but, like, they personally would probably use it. And I, I feel like a lot of the people in the group fall into that category where, you know, there's an interest there. They've just not quite at that step of it actually taking it have you noticed the same yeah i've noticed it uh, the same and i'm getting quite some direct messages as well from people in the group uh, mm -hmm. asking me questions about it and i think um uh, for a lot of people it's also like they're in a way they're scared of starting to use steroids uh, like they're scared of certain side effects and obviously if you google on anabolic steroids and side effects mm -hmm. you'll get a huge list um so, um, in a way, it's good people uh, don't use them because of that. Um, right. But on the other side, I do believe that the side effects in general uh, aren't as bad as portrayed in the media and uh, on most websites on the internet if you start looking uh, for it. Right, um, right. But and that, go ahead. don't interpret these words as an encouragement to start using. Um, I'm just... I think people who want to use them or are using them should be uh, given the truth, the real facts, and not just uh, fear-mongering. Right, right. And that's certainly something we'll get into. I will say one thing, and you see both extremes here, but one thing I see is I'm just amazed at the number of people who use steroids who really don't know much about them at all. And so like for people, some people who listen to the podcast might know this already. Um, I've talked about it a little bit here and there, but you know, after I had been lifting for probably about eight years, so I was like in my low twenties, I definitely, I mean, for prior to that, I just had no interest in steroids. I just, I mean, I, first of all, didn't know how prominent they were. But secondly, I just, I mean, I really, I hadn't gotten close to my potential because I started so young, you know, I was still growing fairly rapidly or, you know, for me at least up to that point. And so I just never really considered it. And then once things started really slowing down and now I'm like eight years in, nine years in, it's like, wow, like this is, this is it. This is all I'm getting. <laughs> um, and so I started looking into it, but my process was basically, I mean, just like most areas of my life that are big decisions, I looked into it very in depth and i you know you know um bill Llewellyn, i always say his name wrong but his his book on anabolics i read through pretty much that whole thing um i read everything i could on forums talking to people you know literature and i wanted to be as informed as possible and i was pretty much ready to make that step but i wanted to also have certain health tests done and unfortunately it seems like i have not a terribly unusual heart but a heart that would be at risk further if I were to take anabolics long term. And so for me, it was one of those things where it's like, look, like I don't have any moral issues with it. I, I don't care if somebody does it. I think in order to excel at certain sports, like in bodybuilding, you pretty much need to do it. But for me, it was just something that was kind of out of the question long term. And so I decided against it. But I will talk to people who have used or are using, and it is amazing how little they know. I mean, and I'm not even just talking about like the dumb bros you think of at the gym who got it from their friend or something. I mean, I'm talking about like people I know now in the fitness industry, in the quote unquote evidence-based fitness industry, who I, like <laughs> who are taking drugs that they literally, I'll say like, do you know what dose? And they're like, oh, well, I don't know the dose. Just this person told me to take that. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like this is, and I'm mean, not even just steroids, like DNP, Clin. I mean, it, it's, it's pretty amazing to me. And if you're seeing that in the fitness industry, like the, fit, the evidence-based fitness industry, you can only imagine in other areas. Yeah, this sounds very uh, recognizable. Uh, a lot of people uh, who start using or have been using for a very long period of time, they simply listen to one or a few people uh, they uh, trust and they rely on for their information. So if one of those guys says you should use this, they'll just kind of blindly follow their advice. And um, whenever issues arise, uh, sort of side effects arise, and they come to, uh, they go online and they research it, or they go to a forum or a Facebook group and ask about it. And like 
they'll be sometimes, depending on what they're using, they'll be confronted like, hey, this is kind of stupid to use. They'll still be so, uh, yeah, like they shoot in a defense mode, like, no, I got it from this guy and he's really good. Right, right. There's just this blind trust in, uh, I want to say, gurus, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, uh, yeah, that's uh, kind of shocking, I say, in the sense that, in my experience, uh, a lot of the gurus uh, don't really know what they're doing either. They're just basing it off on their own experience, which is not really the best thing to go off on when it's concerns uh, steroids and health. Sure, absolutely. So have you seen the film Bigger, Faster, Stronger? Yeah, I've seen it uh, quite some years ago, so I can't really remember uh, a lot of the details, but I have seen it, yeah. Yeah, I think that came out, I remember my friends and I watched it in college, and you know, again, it's like college guys who are lifting, and it's like, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not the most scientifically based documentary. It's, it's a lot of anecdote and, you know, like, where yeah. are the bodies of this thing and, and all that. Um, but basically, a lot of what it talked about was, and I, and I think a lot of people have seen it, and that was kind of their introduction to steroids. And it kind of promotes the idea that, you know, steroids aren't that bad for you and that, you know, like, look at all these people who do it and it's fine. I mean, that's not the only thing that they mentioned in, in the film, of course, but Overall, I think you come away with a sense that steroids aren't that bad. And you mentioned before how, you know, they're, they're really not as bad as the media portrays. And I think you have two sides here. So the average person, you know, probably 98% of people out there who are not in this fitness community, they see steroids as just like the devil and even like not even using logic, like it's cheating to which it's like, you know, what are they cheating at if they're not competing? That literally makes no sense. And, you know, but they have such a demonic view of it. Like it's this horrible thing and you will die if you take them. However, yeah. I also see the other side, which is certainly more prominent in our community where people will say, you know, steroids aren't that bad and look at all these people who use them and they're completely fine. You know, I know a number of bodybuilders who say there's really, I mean, I just had a, he's a friend of mine who's doing his, he's probably going to go pro soon. And he said, you know, there's really no downside to steroids. And I'm thinking like, dude, that is just a ridiculous statement. Like to say there's no downsides to steroids or there's, there's no reason not to use them. I mean, that's just pure ignorance. And so obviously, like a lot of things, it, it's in the middle. But I don't know which one, you, which view you tend to see more nowadays. Um, well, I definitely be in the middle. Um, uh, there are some obvious side effects that steroids can have. And I think most people who are in the on the side, like, hey, they're perfectly safe. They kind of go off with, I'm taking steroids and I'm not feeling bad i'm not feeling sick and i've been taking for a few years and i'm still alive like right yeah that's right. that's kind of true um steroids don't kill you quick uh, right not to say that they definitely kill you in the long term they won't do that either uh, most of the times but they have some side effects that are likely to uh, decrease your lifespan um so even uh, with therapeutic dosages, uh, the most common side effect of testosterone replacement therapy is an increase in hematocrite. So that's an increase in the uh, volume of blood that is occupied by red blood cells. And the higher it gets, the more, let's say, thicker your blood gets, and that goes hand in hand with an increased risk of thrombosis. And Considering that already therapeutic dosages can have such side effects, imagine what higher dosages can do. And with higher dosages, uh, and it varies from person to person, but uh, blood pressure tends to increase a bit. And we kind of know for pretty sure that things that increase blood pressure tend to decrease the lifespan a bit. And what you also see is uh, Pretty much all steroids, they decrease the uh, HDL cholesterol, which is considered the good cholesterol. But it's also fair to say that it's unknown uh, to what degree this actually affects your lifespan or to what degree this affects your risk of cardiovascular disease. But um, 
there's also the thing with the LDL cholesterol, all oral steroids increase LDL cholesterol and they do so quite profoundly. And um, in some individuals, even the injectable uh, steroids increase LDL cholesterol a bit. And the evidence between uh, things that increase LDL cholesterol and increase your risk of cardiovascular disease is quite substantial. We're pretty damn sure that if something increases LDL cholesterol, that that's a bad thing. And then there's also the issue that with uh, prolonged steroid abuse, you start to see changes to the heart that we know are detrimental to its function. Um, usually to a mild to moderate degree, but still all these things stacked up they are likely to simply make you live uh, a shorter life. Right, right. Yeah, the cholesterol thing is interesting. You know, in recent years, some people have questioned the importance of cholesterol levels. I actually had a cardiologist on the podcast early on, probably close to two years ago now, who sent me probably 10 papers correlating higher LDL levels with longer lifespan, decreased levels of disease. And it's, it's interesting that not only is it out there about, you know, discrepant thoughts on cholesterol, but even at the level of a cardiologist, you know, you have some saying that we want LDL as low as possible and a few niche cardiologists saying that they, they actually like higher and it's different when you're on in the keto diets and things like that. Um, certainly, I, I would say that I'd probably still have to follow the general body of evidence showing that <laughs> you want higher HDL lower triglycerides and lower LDL, but it's interesting to see some of these discrepant thoughts on the matter. Yeah, so uh, like the LDL, uh, we have a lot of evidence, uh, like no matter what happens, uh, what causes an increase in LDL or a decrease in LDL, an increase increases the risk and a decrease decreases the risk. Right. But the story for HDL is uh, a bit more complex. So uh, as you might know, there are zero medications out there that are prescribed to increase HDL. And it's not because uh, the pharmaceutical companies have failed to produce a medication that can increase HDL. There have been quite a few candidates for that. Uh, there have been quite a few drugs which have effectively done that. And even like showing really large increases like uh, doubling HDL cholesterol. But the problem uh, with HDL is that if you increase it pharmaceutically, for some reason it doesn't decrease your risk of cardiovascular disease. Mm. And so that also kind of means that the converse holds true. If something decreases your HDL cholesterol, it does not mean that it uh, increases your risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, nevertheless, it is a good uh, measurement if you're not altering it by medication or drugs. HDL cholesterol correlate, correlates very well with cardiovascular disease risk. So the higher you have it naturally, the better. So how are they distinguishing that in studies? Like essentially epidemiologically, they're finding that people with lower HDL have worse outcomes and higher HDL have better outcomes, but any of the drugs that have changed it don't seem to have much of an impact on longevity. Yeah, basically that. Um, Interesting. That's kind of the point. Um, and for LDL, there are a lot of levels of evidence which simply indicate, like we know it from genetic studies as well, pretty much every gene which increases LDL cholesterol in people increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. And we have all these drugs that decrease LDL cholesterol and also decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease. Right. So the evidence on um, altering LDL is very solid, but altering HDL, it's like, it just doesn't seem uh, to work, unfortunately. And so, um, something I know uh, some steroids users uh, do is they take uh, niacin, uh, and that increases HDL cholesterol. Right. But there was a Cochrane review which looked at all the evidence like, hey, is this actually decreasing your risk for cardiovascular disease? And kind of unfortunately, uh, it doesn't seem to do anything in that regard. <laughs> so it does increase your HDL cholesterol, 
but it doesn't decrease your mortality. It doesn't decrease uh, myocardial infarctions. It doesn't decrease any cardiovascular uh, disease. Right, right. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where and I understand the frustration from people because I think one of the reasons people are so likely to just listen to this person or that person is because you see such varying thoughts depending on who you talk to. Even among, I mean, there's a few doctors who are kind of known in the bodybuilding community for like being a guy to go to. Like uh, somebody I've had on before, Dr. Thomas O'Connor. Um, there's a guy, Dr. Rand McLean. There's a few of these guys out there who are kind of known in the community. And I think as far as doctors go, somebody like Dr. Thomas O'Connor is probably one of the most educated and informed on this topic. But even somebody like that, you know, I'll, I'll hear them say things where I'm like, man, like that's just not true. Like he'll say, everybody who takes anything is going to have a crashed HDL, you know, lower than 40. Everybody has HDL lower than 40. Like I saw him say that in a video recently. And I'm like, man, like, they're, not that it doesn't have a negative effect on HDL, but just out of my own interest for it, I've seen so many people's blood work on steroids. I've seen you know studies on it, and there are plenty of people who don't have these horrible effects on HDL. Now, part of that is going to be genetic. Part of that's going to be what you're taking. I mean, if yeah. somebody's taking you know an oral steroid along with like Trend, let's say, yeah, you're probably going to have a completely tanked HDL. Yeah. But, there are many people who are on testosterone replacement therapy for years and years at, you know, very standard doses who have good cholesterol. Like I've seen people's blood work many times that show that. And so uh, I, I think a lot of people talk in extremes when it comes to this topic. And especially at therapeutic doses, I don't think it has to be this extreme thing. I, I think um, probably when TRT first started becoming popular, the benefits were overstated. You know, I, I don't think it's this fountain of youth that a lot of people talk about, especially for somebody who's already kind of like normal to low normal. You know, if you're 45 years old yeah. and you have testosterone at 350 nanograms per deciliter, is bringing that up to 600 or 700 going to drastically change your life? Probably not. But for the people who actually need it, I, I think it can make a huge difference. And I do think, like you said, sometimes the uh, the detriments to it are overstated as well. Yeah, and uh, I even cite at least one study in my book in which they didn't find a decrease in HDL cholesterol in uh, uh, hypogonadal men taking testosterone replacement therapy. Right. And quite in fact, uh, one of the studies by Shalender Bazin, or however you pronounce it, uh, in which they used 600 milligrams a week surprisingly also didn't show a decrease in HDL cholesterol. Now that single study is a bit of an outlier in that regard, uh, but it does show that the effect, depending on the steroids, can be small. And I'm sure uh, in some individuals, it simply doesn't affect HDL cholesterol at all. Um, some studies even, like they have these graphs in which uh, if they have a low number of subjects, they show the individual patient data. And in some of these studies, they also plot uh, how uh, steroid affected their HDL cholesterol. And with some of the folks in those studies, you simply don't see a decrease at all. So, Right, right. Yeah, and like we said, a lot of that is going to be genetic. I mean, I look at yeah. you know my levels and my cholesterol, my HDL has always been, not always, but the, you know, they say generally you want above 40 once you're looking at cardiac risk factors, above 60 for HDL is considered a negative risk factor. I mean, I've had HDLs in the 80s. My last HDL was like 96, which is pretty unusual, especially for a male. Uh, females tend to have higher levels of HDL. But, you know, so you could literally cut my levels in half and I would still have above the recommended level. But that's obviously going to be, you know. I mean, I, I obviously exercise, I take fish oil, I do other things that are supposedly beneficial for it. But a lot of that, like a lot of these things, is, is going to come down to genetic genetic response, yeah. for sure. So something that you, you touched on that 600 milligram study, and, and I'm glad that, I, well, actually, I'll say first that your book really impressed me. Obviously, um, I haven't read the entire thing <laughs> in the time you sent it to me, but I, I've read through a decent amount. And... I have to say, man, like I'm really impressed the depth that you go into. Um, anybody who is interested in the topic, I would definitely recommend it. 
And even things that you just don't hear a lot of people talk about, like one thing that I think is a problem, and I see this so much by people who are using steroids or promoting steroids, they will talk about their blood work. And I've seen people who are, in my opinion, pretty foolish about it, like, uh, not that this guy is a good source of information, but <laughs> Jason Blaha, who was, you know, pretty popular on YouTube, and he talked about, you know, getting his blood work done off cycle and things were fine. But that's not even that unusual, because I said, well, your blood work's going to be shit on cycle, so you just get it tested off cycle. And I'm like, well, don't you want to know what is happening? If, if you're doing multiple, let's say, 12-week cycles and your blood work is horrible, You'd probably want to know that, first of all. But secondly, a lot of these issues that you can have won't show up on blood work. And that's, I think, yeah. an even larger point. I mean, people will say, well, look, my cholesterol is great. I'm fine. And it's like, dude, if you have blood clots forming, potentially, that's often not going to show up in blood work. Um, like you mentioned, there are detrimental effects to cardiac muscles that you know, you're never really going to see. I mean, yeah, if you have a heart attack... <laughs> you're going to see increased levels <laughs> of it's too late. BNP, right, and troponin levels and things like that. But, um, you know, one thing that people don't really consider is, and, and we can get into this. Well, actually, before we do, like, why don't you talk about some of these detrimental effects you see on the heart as far that won't get shown up on blood work? Yeah, so um, the heart is... Um, Let's start with my recommendation about this is simply go to a cardiologist and get an echo done once a year. Um, that's the only way you'll know uh, how steroids are going to impact your heart and what it might mean for you in terms of risk. And so uh, the problem with studies done with uh, uh, steroid users and the heart is that we have a few which are randomized, uh, double-blind, uh, controlled, um, but those use just quite low dosages. Um, I think the highest was 200 milligrams of uh, nandrolone a week. So, like, it's very limited, uh, the amount of good quality evidence we have. And then the other types of studies, they're either uh, cross-sectional in nature, which means they get a bunch of steroid users, of non-steroid users and at one moment in time they do these measurements and now if you find differences between these two groups that does not necessarily mean that the steroids have caused it um, something i'd like to say is uh, and this obviously is just a gross generalization but the average average steroid user is also a drug user right um, he doesn't only use steroids, he probably uses some ancillary drugs that go along with it, and also recreational drugs, um, like a lot of surveys uh, show this. And, uh, of course, people who don't use steroids can also use recreational drugs and the likes, but on average, they do so to a lesser extent. And another issue uh, with interpreting these studies is that steroid users, on average, are just a lot bigger than non-steroid users, and uh, they might be training more intensely, longer, etc. And we also know that uh, resistance exercise impacts some of these measurements of the heart, which aren't necessarily detrimental uh, in nature. Right. Um, and another issue is that um, these cardiac changes uh, are very subtle. Uh, when you're not using steroids for a long period of time. If you do a cycle of 10 weeks and that's it, you're probably not going to find a yoda of difference uh, with your heart. And so it's also difficult with these studies to find enough bodybuilders who've been using steroids for a long enough period of time. Either way, um, when you look at the scientific literature as a whole, you do see that uh, something called the left ventricle uh, increases in mass, uh, even when you correct for uh, the body surface area, because mm -hmm. we know if you get bigger, your left ventricle gets a bit bigger as well. So there's a disproportional increase in mass of the left ventricle. And what they also see is that the wall of the left ventricle uh, becomes thicker. And this is not necessarily a bad thing, 
but there are additional measurements they're doing to assess the function of the heart, uh, to assess how good it is pumping and how good it is filling with blood. And they see uh, that the function of the heart is also declining to a small degree. So these structural changes seem to be uh, bad in nature. They don't seem to be uh, neutral in nature. Right. Right. And, and that's one of those things, like you said, you talked about an echocardiogram and it's like, you know, I would say maybe 10% of people who take steroids even get blood work done. I would say maybe 1% get echocardiograms. Yeah. I mean, it's just a very small percentage. And, you know, yeah. that's not even talking about changes to your liver or things that could happen to your kidneys. And I, again, I don't want to fear monger because I, I think that's probably done enough by the media. But I also do think it's one of those things where, you know, people who have heard my podcast, they might hear me talk about genetics a lot and, you know, our limitations. And the thing is, it's because I'm speaking to my audience. So I would not tell the average person who wants to get in shape, well, you know, you're really going to be limited by your genetics. You should consider that <laughs> because the average person, like by a long shot, j just needs to work harder, be more dedicated, be consistent, things like that. Right. Yeah. So when I say, hey, you know, you need to have realistic expectations. I'm not talking to that average person. I'm talking to the people who have been committed to this for a long time, who are really pushing themselves who maybe are down on themselves because they're not where they want to be. That's who I'm talking to in that example. And when it comes to something like this, yeah, for the average person, I would probably, you know, they already know that steroids are going to cause a lot of issues. And so maybe to them, I might say, hey, well, you know, steroids aren't as bad as you probably think they are. But for the person listening to this podcast, a lot of them might be in the camp that say, hey, there's no issues with steroids and I'm just going to take them. And so for that, I think you need to understand that it's not just, hey, you know, you do a 12 week cycle and you'll be fine. I mean, first of all, you know, if you just do one cycle, you're probably not going to be keeping very much of the progress you make anyway, long term. But secondly, it's if you are making a commitment to that lifestyle of using steroids for years and years, there are things that you need to worry about. And that like we talked about that won't be picked up in blood work. So, you know, you talked about yeah. the left ventricle. Um, Obviously, we won't get into all of the anatomy and physiology of the heart here, but just for people listening, I mean, the left ventricle is what pumps out blood to the rest of your body. And so when you look at things like somebody's ejection fraction, you know, normally a good percentage there is 55 to 70 percent. And when you do studies on people who are using steroids for long term, you do tend to see decreases in ejection fraction there. Yeah. Um, not always, but on average, you do. Uh, as you mentioned, you see an enlargement of the myocardium. You know, oftentimes you see both concentric hypertrophy, which is a yep. thickening of the walls. You can see eccentric hypertrophy, which is a dilation of the walls. Um, and, and so these are changes that sometimes are reversible. And when you look at studies that show people who then come off steroids, oftentimes you see a reversal, but not all of the time. For example, the what we were just talking about there ejection fraction is a measurement of systolic function but then there's also diastolic function which is basically the relaxation portion of the heart and when you look at that you have and i don't mean to get too technical but i know peter you know all of this um mm. you know you look at things like e-wave velocity which is the speed of basically the diastolic function and you can look at things like ea ratio and these things also have detrimental effects when or you know there's a detrimental effect on them when using anabolics and those are sometimes those changes are not reversible when you look at people who when you compare i actually seen a somewhat i don't know how recent the study was i've recently read it and when they looked at non-users compared to current users compared to people who previously used but are no longer using some of the changes were reversed, but a lot of them were not completely reversed. You know, they were lasting diastolic dysfunction. And these are things that, like you said, are, they're not going to kill you next year, but they could take a significant portion of your life away. And it's easy to be 20 and think, hey, I don't really care, but you might care when you're 65, you know. Exactly. Like you got a large reserve capacity of the heart. So when you're young, you got a lot of leeway. But then when you get older and your heart kind of de degenerates uh, in a sense either way um, y when you've been using steroids for a long period of time you simply start off with a smaller reserve capacity to uh, be able to cope with these new detrimental changes to the heart that will occur as you get older 
Uh, so in that sense, when you do get old, uh, above 65, above 70, um, these things really start to matter. And as you mentioned, um, so the studies show uh, at least a partial reversibility of some of these changes. And it's a bit hard to say uh, if it can eventually reverse uh, fully. Uh, my expectation would be not fully in at least a subset of users. Um, but a problem with these studies is that they uh, it's hard to simply like ideally you get a group of users who have used it for a couple of years and then you follow them in time for at least several years after that and uh, the studies we have at hand with this is that they simply ask people like have you ever used steroids in the past if right. so how long ago was it and then they kind of compare these people to the current users and to non-users and kind of go off like, okay, the difference between these people who aren't using anymore and the non-users, that's likely the, uh, are likely the changes that aren't reversible. But there are a lot of caveats to it, obviously. Sure, sure. And yeah, I mean, I just don't want people to think that there's no consequences, because especially, you know, you're young, you know, YOLO and all that, and it's just, <laughs> you, you start to go after that desire for the immediate gratification and i think maybe this would be a good time to talk about some of the misconceptions in terms of even like results and i know your your book is not really a how-to guide or anything like yeah. that but i think one of the things that's interesting is and this is just a common problem in the industry and in general people will look at mean data right and they'll look at the averages and they'll say wow you know in this study of using testosterone 600 milligrams this these people put on 20 pounds of lean body mass right or something like that yeah. and they don't look at individual data points or sometimes you know the individual data points aren't even available but the reality is in any study you often see a very large variation in results yeah. and I, I see misconceptions both ways. You know, I say I see people who are massive, <laughs> like pro bodybuilders, talk about how steroids are just the icing on the cake, and it's it's <laughs> all you know, it's it's my nutrition and my sleep and it's my dedication and my training. Is you just don't know how I train and like stuff like that is so unbelievably ridiculous when some of these people have fifty pounds on like the top natural bodybuilders and so to hear somebody say that is, is just incredibly ridiculous and i think most people listening know that steroids can have a dramatic effect they can make a huge difference yeah. however the other side of that is you do have a lot of natural trainees and they will say well this person it's, it's only steroids and if i took steroids i would look like that and you know i know plenty of guys who have done a cycle or two and they got impressive results relative to where they were but they did not look like bodybuilders even you know i'm talking guys who were like 170 pounds in college took some steroids got up to like 185 and they looked a lot better but you're not talking these like giant changes so and then again what's going to be the difference there and how you respond genetics right yeah. the people That's on exactly. average people who already look amazing are going to look super amazing <laughs> on steroids and if, if you look like crap after five to ten years of natural training you're probably just going to look a little less crappy <laughs> on steroids you know pretty much yeah so if a study shows that they put on say uh, 15 pounds of muscle using steroids on average that means some guys probably put on seven or eight pounds of muscle but some other dude might have put on 25 or 30 pounds of muscle uh, using the same dosage because um, as you say, there's a large variation in how people uh, respond to training and to the drugs. And uh, yeah, it's probably the main determinant, uh, pretty much your genetics and how well you respond to drugs. Right. And yeah, I mean, just in general response to drugs, and that applies with health too. I mean, you know, people who take different medications, some people get a really robust response, other people don't. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know I, I'd probably becoming known for always harping on genetics, but I mean, it's just, it, it's kind of ubiquitous in how it affects one in terms of response to training, nutrition, medication, steroids, all these things. It, it, it is kind of that factor that you can't control as of now and tends to have a pretty big influence on, on what you see. Yeah, definitely.
So are there any misconceptions that we did not cover that you find in terms of steroids, whether it be results wise or health effects or anything like that, that you see commonly talked about and you, you know from your research is incorrect? Well, one touchy subject is uh, post-cycle therapy. So mm. that's basically the practice of taking uh, some drugs after your steroid cycle to speed up the process of restoring your own testosterone production again. And um, commonly used drugs for this are these so-called selective estrogen receptor modulators. These uh, act on the estrogen receptors either as an agonist, so a stimulating factor, or an antagonist, inhibiting factor, depending on the tissue. And the thing is that estrogen decreases your own testosterone production, basically, by acting on uh, some parts of the brain, the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And so the idea is that if you take these drugs, they block this inhibiting effect of estrogen in the brain, and that will restore your testosterone production uh, quicker. And there's quite some evidence for this in, uh, in normal men even. Like if you're a healthy person and you take uh, one of those drugs like Clomid, you'll see your testosterone increase. And you see the same in a lot of these hypogonadal states, uh, obesity-related hypogonadism uh, or uh, aging-associated uh, hypogonadism or some other states of hypogonadism, you take Clomid and you see testosterone increase. So the reasoning is that if you take these drugs after a cycle, your testosterone will increase more rapidly too. Um, but so far, there is no published study which has evaluated this in steroid uses to see if this actually is the case. And um, there is a study coming out soon. Uh, I know the lead author, uh, Diedrich Smith, uh, he has written the foreword of the book as well. They've done an, quite a unique study uh, by recruiting 100 people who were going to use steroids. They took blood measurements right before they started using their own cycle. They took blood measurements during the cycle and they took blood measurements several times after they stopped using steroids. And uh, around one fifth of these 100 bodybuilders didn't use post-cycle therapy and the other four fifth did. So they could make a comparison between these two groups. Obviously it's not ideal because there is no randomization. So there could right. be other factors uh, explaining the results. But what was interesting is that they saw absolutely no difference in testosterone levels uh, after the cycle between both groups. And like there are some obvious other drawbacks as well. Like people could say like they did post-cycle therapy wrong and this and that. Um, that's all nice and all. But if these drugs had a big effect size, at least, you would definitely see that in this study. Mm -hmm. And they saw absolutely no difference. Um, so at best, they have a small effect size, uh, but they might as well have no effect. And I think this might be the case because a big difference between steroid-induced hypogonadism and all these other forms of hypogonadism is like if you have uh, obesity related hypogonadism you're in this steady state of hypogonadism um, and that goes for all these forms of hypogonadism and the difference with steroid induced hypogonadism is it's transient it's temporarily um, it, your body just needs time to make testosterone again it will so in time eventually and there is already a strong signal for the body to produce testosterone again. As in, after you come off steroids, your testosterone and estrogen levels will plummet. They will be low. You'll see this in everyone after steroids. If you stop quit using steroids and you measure your blood, say, uh, four to five weeks later, testosterone and estrogen will both be very low. So the brain is already getting the signal like, hey, uh, go do your job and mm -hmm. uh, output the DNRH and subsequently the LH and FSH, which will stimulate testosterone production. 
uh, but it's simply not happening for whatever reason. Uh, and so I don't think that the addition of a serum uh, like amplifying the signal will uh, speed this up. That's um, interesting. So do you, I mean, because certainly that is different than what a lot of people will promote. Do you yeah. feel that the notion that some people will talk about when you come off steroids, your testosterone plummets, but your estrogen is higher, at least from a relative standpoint, yeah. do you so feel in, like that's just incorrect? Well, from a relative standpoint, uh, possibly. I've seen that on uh, multiple occasions. But in absolute terms, uh, estrogen after a cycle simply is low. It's pretty low. Um, and just for whatever reason, your body still isn't producing uh, uh, enough testosterone again. And the thing just is, there's currently no evidence to support uh, the usage of serums uh, with steroid-induced hypogonadism. And the little ev good evidence that there is, which will probably be published in the next couple of months, suggests it doesn't work. So. I suspect at best it will have a small effect, uh, but there is uh, a really good chance that it simply has no effect uh, on average. Yeah, that's really interesting. So when is that study coming out? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, as far as I know, uh, they've already submitted the results to uh, a journal. Um, but uh, the lead author has published or not published, like he has put some of this data on Facebook and he shared it with me. Um, and to be honest, I also was a bit surprised when I saw the data. I wouldn't have expected it up front. Uh, but after some talking with uh, that endocrinologist as well, I came a bit to this position and I kind of agree with him um, that there is a substantial difference between steroid-induced hypogonadism and these other states of hypogonadism in which serums do work. Yeah, that's definitely interesting. I, I mean, there's an endocrinologist I know, and a so it's, it's actually there's kind of like a group of us who talk. And so one is an endocrinologist and one is a urologist. And so the endocrinologist more so focuses on getting some people off steroids. And he his approach is one that I I don't really hear much at all. Um, so it's interesting to me. He will lower people's dosages very gradually to the point that, because a lot of times people will just come off and, and his approach is, he's actually said that he thinks that would be the fastest way to get somebody's natural levels back was just to come off, but that, you know, a lot of these guys don't want to do that. So he will actually just taper them off to the point that they're at quite low levels, which to me, I would think you're just kind of delaying the shutdown at that point and delaying, like, just like, it, extending the period of time that you're dealing with negative side effects. Um, I guess his theory is that when you get your dosage low enough, you won't be completely shut down, which is also a different view than I've typically heard. It, you know, I've generally heard, for instance, in contrast to like thyroid medication, when somebody takes thyroid medication, right, you take a little bit, your thyroid production, your natural thyroid production goes down a little bit, and there's kind of this compensation. So people who are maybe have hypothyroidism or even subclinical hypothyroidism, uh, they tend to, there's a balance between your natural production and dosage. Whereas when it comes to testosterone, I had always kind of heard it as more of like an on and off switch. So once you're taking even low doses, like I, and I think they even show that in, um, in some of the studies where they use like 25 milligrams, it's not like their natural, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it doesn't seem like their natural production is only shut down a little bit so that they kept normal levels. It seems like even those who took 25 milligrams or 50 milligrams had significantly repressed levels. Is, is that right? Um, this is something I don't really uh, have sharp in my memory, but from what I recall, uh, some of these studies with replacement dosages, you usually do see uh, still quite some output of LH and FSH. Uh, okay. Uh, not a lot, but more than zero. So the pituitary is clearly still uh, secreting some LH and FSH, and you could say there's a uh, partial suppression at that point. Okay, and, and maybe um, that's the case. I know when looking at the total testosterone numbers, they're quite low, but perhaps, like you said, maybe it's just a non-zero value that they're getting from their natural pituitary. Yeah, and uh, 
in these men, you definitely not with all men, but on average, uh, not even on average, by the way, but I think it's something like one third of these men, they uh, still uh, continue to produce sperm in uh, significant amounts as well, which indicates the uh, at least that part of the testicular function is still stimulated uh, sufficiently to do something. Um, but I do agree with you that uh, that practice is simply delaying your recovery. But um, as you also said, a lot of users don't like the idea of just uh, coming off cold turkey. So in practice, this can be a way to get people to get used to simply less androgens in the system and then eventually come off. So it could definitely uh, from a pr pragmatic uh, point of view, be something you could use to get people off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's certainly it's it's his main approach from what he's told me. And the urologist, he's more in the camp of. I think obviously as a urologist, he's focusing on fertility as well. But he will talk about getting guys on HCG, which you know you can get into a whole different conversation on primary versus secondary hypogonadism. Um, but, you know, his idea is get people's sperm production going. I mean, my understanding is the studies on HCG show that to be very effective, but that might just be more from a temporary stimulation in FSH and LH because obviously it's acting as LH. But my understanding is that it does even show increases in FSH when they look at the studies. I'm not sure in terms of long term, like once you come off the... HCG, are you still going to have a benefit from it or are you still going to be shut down? That I'm not sure. I think that's debated. Yeah, so that's uh, the question. Um, like uh, some steroid users, they use HCG on cycle to prevent primary hypogonadism from developing. Uh, and there might be some merit to it. Uh, there's one study which did show an impairment of the testicles uh, functioning with regard to responding to LH to produce testosterone. So uh, I think they did this measurement something like three or four weeks after a cycle. So at least there seems to be a short period of time after a cycle in which the testicles don't respond well either. So there's some degree of primary hypogonadism going on. And I think it's like a fair extrapolation to assume that if you take HCG during your cycle, you'll be able to prevent it. It's just good evidence that when you take HCG, even when you take it in conjunction with uh, testosterone, your uh, own testosterone production will continue and your own sperm prediction uh, will continue as well. Uh, even if you use it for months on end, uh, this has been studied, it keeps working. Right, right. Yeah, man. so very interesting stuff here. Um, I, I think hopefully we didn't lose people when getting too technical, but hopefully at the same time, if anybody is considering steroid use, they are getting into the small details and they're, they're fully understanding the health ramifications and what can happen during and after. So, you know, obviously we, we couldn't cover all of it, but I think we covered quite a bit. Before we sign off, anything else that you wanted to cover that we didn't get to or that you thought would be pertinent to cover? Mm. Maybe like a tiny little thing, like you mentioned the kidneys earlier. Sure. Um, yep. Like there is very little information about how steroids affect the kidneys. Mm -hmm. And uh, all in all, if you look in practice, it probably uh, doesn't do that much uh, to the kidneys, if at all. But there is some evidence that indicates that it can be uh, detrimental to the kidneys as well. And... If you want to be sure your kidneys are okay, um, besides doing a blood test, you could also do a urine test and see if there's protein in your urine. Because um, protein shouldn't be in your urine. And if it is, it's an uh, indication of uh, something going on with your kidneys, which shouldn't happen. So that might be a nice addition for the folks who care a lot about their health. Yeah. Uh, do the annual echo of the heart and also uh, like annually I do a urine measurement to check for protein in your urine. So what do you think it is then that if you look in like the pro bodybuilding community, you tend to actually see a decent amount of kidney issues that you, I would say, don't see in lower levels as much, or maybe you just don't hear about it as much. So obviously, you know, chronic high blood pressure can lead to kidney issues. So yeah. when you talk about, you know, steroids themselves, are you talking about, 
the actual compounds not having that detrimental effect, but what they cause, i.e. blood pressure issues, could have more of an effect. Uh, it does seem like there are some significant kidney issues in the community. Yeah, so um, in pro circles, you do see this. Uh, in amateurs, I hardly uh, ever see it. Mm -hmm. So that could be related to the size of the bodybuilders and the blood pressure that's being untreated in these guys. Um, but it could also be related to other drugs these people are taking, uh, like the uh, painkillers, some of them, the NSAIDs, uh, they can cause kidney injury as well. But it might also simply be a result of chronic steroid abuse in really high dosages. Mm -hmm. um, so there is one study uh, with a small sample, uh, I think it were like 10 bodybuilders. On average, they were really big. Um, so it was not your average gym rat taking steroids. Right. Uh, like one of them was, I think it was uh, 130 kilograms or something. So 275 pounds, uh, really heavy guys. Uh, and they saw uh, a very specific kind of kidney disease called focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, uh, which in a nutshell simply means that uh, part of the filtration function of the kidneys starts to fail and you end up with uh, protein in your urine. Uh, and there is some in vitro research which suggests that androgens might have a direct effect uh, on the uh, kidneys as well. Right. But yeah, there's just so little uh, evidence about this that it's really hard to say uh, in how much steroids cause this directly or through increased blood pressure or that it might be one of the ancillary drugs that they're taking that's causing it. Um, but either way, uh, a simple method to detect this is simply do an annual uh, urine test. Sure, right, right. Well, man, I think what I'm looking forward to most is when Lyle eventually finally jumps on his 600 milligrams and then he can <laughs> take the fitness industry finally by storm. My <laughs> I actually, I would love to see him get on because he, he talked about on his other podcast with me that he had like low normal levels, I believe. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, in that case, you know, I don't, I don't know if there's really that big of a reason not to consider it, especially because he's, I think he's around 50 years old at this point. So... Who knows? Might make him a new man. Who knows? We might see this in our lifetime. Right, right. <laughs> All right, man. So if people want to get this book, where can they find it? Uh, Bookonsteroids.com. Awesome. And I, I know you're not, you know, you don't have like a huge social media presence. Is there anything or anywhere people can reach out to you if they have questions? Um, well, I have an Instagram. Uh, my account is uh, at peterbond.nl. Uh, so not .org, but .nl. Uh, and you can find me on Facebook, uh, Peter Bond. I'm active in the in Lyle's group. So uh, if you have questions, feel free to just shoot them at me. Awesome. Thanks so much, man. You're welcome. And thank you for having me.